Good evening and welcome to our ongoing lecture series called Towards a Meaningful Life. My name is Rabbi Yabba Promoter, and tonight is part three of our six part series. If for some odd reason you missed parts one and two, you can always catch them on my Facebook page, right? So you don't have to worry and get upset. Oh, Rabbi, I missed one and two. They're always available online. Tonight is part number three. And tonight we're going to be dealing with something that I feel is extremely appropriate. Very, very appropriate for these times. You know, we've been suffering for the past number of months with COVID, you know, and that has kept a lot of people indoors much more than usual. So this issue of turning a house into a home, how to turn your house into a home is the topic that we're going to be dealing with this evening. All right. But before we get into the lecture itself, ladies and gentlemen, I have to make, first of all, two observations. Observation number one is the world is going crazy. Now, not because of politics, or what's happening with the election. I'm not even talking about anything like that. Today happens to be November the 10th, November the 10th. I live in Long Beach, California. I come from and I grew up in Montreal, Canada. I moved from Montreal, Canada, in a series of steps to California because Montreal was the frozen thundra. Like we call Jews from Canada, the frozen chosen, right? But today, in, on November the 10th, the high today for Long Beach, California was 66. In Montreal, it was 73. My cousin told my wife, 73 degrees in Montreal, 66 degrees in Long Beach, California. Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on in this world? It's going, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's wacko. All right. That's one observation. Okay. Observation number two. I had posted two times about this lecture series this evening, two times, once yesterday and once today, both different, different posts. On the first post, I used some negativity. I'll get to that in a moment. On the second post, I went straight, no negativity. Which one do you think got more reaction? The one where I went straight, come to the lecture series tonight, building a house into a home. It's part of a, it's part of towards a meaningful life etc 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 with a nice you know a picture there that was one yesterday i posted oh a broken home oh how sad a broken home well, ladies and gentlemen i have to report to you this evening that the negativity got much more much more uh, uh attention than non-negativity why because i'm telling you ladies and gentlemen negativity sells all I had to do was put the words, oh, yeah, broken home. And people said, oh, broken home, a broken home, something bad. Right away, we went to it. If I just said, hey, everything is all right. It, I'm going to be talking about a house. Eh, who, who cares? Who cares about a house? Which always, this is not, this is not something new. But unfortunately, negativity sells, you know, in America. So that's why I want to start off tonight's lecture by saying that tonight, we're not going to only talk about turning a house into a home. That would be too positive. That's just uh, too power of too vanilla. No, no. It has to be with some spice. It's got to be how to avoid making your home broken. How do you stop from breaking your home? Oh, now he's talking business because now he's talking about a broken home, negativity, issues. Okay, so that's what gets you going and that's what brings you here to the lectures. Fine. Fine, but I'm going to try to be positive with some positive ideas in how to really build a house into a home. And, and a byproduct is going to be, you're not going to have a broken home. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome everybody that's that, that, that chimed in. It's always a pleasure to hear. So if you are so inclined, write me a little note and tell me that you're here. So I'll say hello to Karen and Lucy. It's so great to see you guys and everybody else that is checking in. All right, let's start off with some definitions, okay? Because it's very important in any time that you want to solve a problem, it is always a good idea to understand what we're talking about. 
let's define exactly the two issues. One, we have home, and one, we have a house. What's the difference between a house and a home? That's num question number one. Question number two is going to be, what is it that makes your house into a home? You personally. Because don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, my job here is to number one, to get us all in the mood, in the mind, you know, inspire myself and hopefully through this medium inspire you to live a more meaningful life. Like that's, that's the key. I mean, me just speaking for an hour, so what, you know, big deal. But you know what? It has to be where I want to make a difference in my life and hopefully make a little difference in your life. So the second question we need to answer, what is it that makes your particular house into a home? So in order to answer these two questions, I want to, I want to start by separating two separate needs. Human beings need, have needs. We have needs. We have needs. But we want to break them down tonight in two general categories. Category number one is we're going to talk about physical needs. And category number two, we're going to talk about spiritual and emotional needs. Okay? These two needs. So if we break down and we understand that this is what human beings need, we're going to get a better picture of what a house is and what a home is supposed to be. A house, I would say, pretty much fits the bill for everything that you need in the physical world. It has four walls, it has a roof, it has many rooms, including bathrooms and showers and, 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 and bedrooms and closets, all right? So what does a house do? What does it accomplish? A house accomplishes, number one, and we'll go through a number of different things a house accomplishes. Number one, it's shelter from the elements meaning it's raining outside, it's cold outside, come into the house, I'm nice and warm. Nice and warm, great, great. Good to see everybody here again that, that, that's, that's chiming in. I see people are, are, are texting in. Great to have you guys here tonight. So number one, what does a house do? It gives you shelter from the elements, warm and comfortable. Number two, it, it's a protection from all the robbers out there. I mean, imagine if you didn't have any walls, you have your, you have your own things, you have clothes, you have with dishes, you got jewelry, you have a whole bunch of things. So what a house does is it protects you from the thieves. You close everything up, you lock the doors, lock the windows, make sure, okay, no one's coming into the house. Number two, it's a place where to put things. You own a whole bunch of things because we are consumers. Americans are great consumers. So we buy, buy, buy. If you don't have a house, where are you going to put everything? There's another, there's another good thing, another need that a house fills and in a very practical sense you know, when you come down to it it's a place where we sleep and we eat that's that's what a house does and it takes care of all of what we call our physical needs and there's many more but i just brought up four examples you could bring up many more examples if you if you if you'd like and people already already commenting you know you could could you could but that's basically one aspect of what a house does is it fulfills all of your physical needs from where you sleep to where you eat to where you keep your things to keep you safe and warm and and, 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 and protected from the outside elements. And that's basically what a house does. Okay, fine. That's great. That would be, I would call, our physical, our bodily needs. But we are not only physical and bodily. We are much more than that. We are human beings that have emotion and we also have a spiritual side. Now, none of that, both our emotional and both our spiritual side or our soul is not being fulfilled by what I said before about this house. It has to change. Something more has to come into it in order for it to go through this transformation, this metamorphosis from a house into a home. Because what does a home accomplish? A home is meets all of your deep emotional needs. Ah. Here is something else, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're going to introduce not our physical, but our emotional and spiritual needs. For example, what a home does that a house could never do is it gives us a sense of self. Oh, look at me. I'm a somebody. I have a home. I am here. This is my place. I am a somebody. It gives me a great sense of self, you know, of who I am. 
and what I am. That a house cannot do. That's not in the physical world. That's only in your emotional, deep emotional state. Number two, it gives us a sense of comfort. Oh, wow. When you're walking through that door, right? And many, many experts tell us, psychologists have, 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 you know, have, have guided people and have advised people that before you come into your house, a good idea is before you open that front door, take three long breaths. And then open up the door. Why? Because you're coming into some place where you want to feel a sense of comfort. Ah, here's where I can relax. Outside in the world, ladies and gentlemen, in the public domain, no one is asking you and is interested in your relaxation. No one cares about your comfort. Out there in the world, everybody has their own worries and their own problems. And what they're doing out there in the world is hustling and bustling. Now, I'm talking about pre-COVID. Now, after COVID, things have slowed down a little bit. Not much pre-COVID in the normal times, right? You went on into the world, you went to your job, and think about it. People, people were living in New York. You get up in the morning, you walk outside, there's already a hustle, a bustle. You go downstairs into the subway system, people are jostling, you know, for a spot. You get a seat, you don't get a seat, you're squashed over there. You go out uh, into Manhattan, thousands and thousands of people walking, you come into your building. I mean, out there, it's just, no one, no one cares about you. No one cares about you. You just, you're just you're trying to focus, get to your job, get it done, get back into the subway, jostling again, back and forth. You finally get out, you walk a few blocks to your home. Ah, you're at your front door. You take the three breaths, you open up. <sighs> Close the door. This is my, this is where I can relax. This is where I can relax. This is a home, ladies and gentlemen, not a house. This is what makes it a home. You also have a sense of belonging. This is where I belong. I mean, you know what? Out there in out there in the world, like the soul, it has to find itself not at ease with the culture out there. There's a lot of things out there in the world that if you take our spiritual side of how we're supposed to live, it's not always in tune with what goes on in the, in, in American culture, right? We we as Jews, let's say we want to keep kosher. It's hard to find a restaurant here. You know, in Long Beach, we want to do other things. Shabbos doesn't seem like a very Shabbos place, you know, here in Long Beach, cars are driving. So out there in the world, you know what? Your soul is not getting nurtured. But here in this home, here, ah, I have a sense of belonging. This is really where I belong. Because in here, all of my values are met. I don't have to worry. I come and I kiss the mezuzah. My kitchen is a kosher kitchen. I'm nurturing my soul, and I'm also nurturing my mind, and I'm nurturing my heart. This is where I belong. This is where, you know, it's comfortable. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And that leads, ladies and gentlemen, to a sense of emotional security. Because, again, out there in the world, no matter who you are, no one cares. I mean, not because people are cruel and people are mean. It's that everybody has their own needs to meet. So you know what? If you have sure parents or siblings or friends out there, but generally in the world out there, you have to make it on your own. But when you come into your home, when you walk through that front door, all of a sudden you have tremendous emotional security. You know that here, ladies and gentlemen, you are safe. You are safe. Then you know what? It's going to be okay. You're not going to get criticized. No one's going to beat you up as they are out there in the world. Your boss is not going to come and belittle you. No one is going to hassle you. Here you have a sense of emotional security. You're safe here. You're absolutely safe, you know, here in this, you know, in this home. Then you have this idea of sense of permanence. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I want to refer you back a couple of weeks ago, when we read the portion of Abraham, when God said to Abraham, Lech Lecha, I want you to travel. Abraham was worried. God said, what are you worried about? Well, traveling diminishes a number of different things that human beings need. Number one, it doesn't give me a sense of permanence. A nomad keeps going from one place to another, to another, to another. It's difficult. It's difficult finding a job. It's difficult people getting to know you. It's difficult making friends. It's all... All of these things are difficult when you're not settled in one spot. And this is what Abraham was worried about. God had to say to him, listen, Abraham, you have a different men mission. You have a different destiny. Everybody else, yes, a home gives them a sense of per permanence. 
But you, you have to travel a little bit. You will one day settle down, don't worry, but not right now. So that tells us that, you know what? The traveling interferes with this quality of life. So when you have a home and you've done what you're supposed to do in that home, it gives you literally a sense of permanence. This is where I am. So we have, we have all of these things, a strong sense of self, a strong sense of comfort, of belonging, of security, of permanence. All of those are intangible things. They're not physical things. They're intangible that rest themselves in our mind, in our soul, in our hearts. And only a home, only a home could give it. Not four walls and a roof, only a home. And that, my friends, is really the critical point of tonight's discussion of how to turn a house into a home. How do we achieve getting from four walls and a roof and many rooms? I don't care how big that house is. That house could have two bedrooms or that house could have 23 bedrooms or 123 bedrooms. It doesn't matter. How do we get that structure to give you all of the necessary emotional and spiritual needs to make you feel comfort, belonging, secure, and permanent? Because once you have that, ladies and gentlemen, once you are secure in that sense, you know what that leads to? Once you have all of that emotional self-containment right now, number one is you're a happier person. You're a happier person. And what happens when you're a happier person? It automatically leads to being a better person and having good character. So you know what? You're not as angry as much. You know what? You're not as jealous as much. You know what? You All of a sudden, everything comes into play that you need. Now you happen to be a good person. Because why? It, it, all of this is an advantage of having a home. You know what? You're a good, you're a good, you're a good guy. It gives you a sense of confidence. Think about this. If you have a good home, you wake up in the morning and you're going to go to work, but you know that you come from a sanctuary. You know that right after work, you're going to go back. So no matter what happens to you in the world, no matter how much they drag you down, no matter what, what happens is you have a place. You have a place where you could then go to where nobody else can infiltrate. No one can infiltrate that place. It gives you a complete sense of confidence. You walk into your job thinking, hey, you know what? Behind me stands something that is a structure, but not only a structure in a physical sense. It's a structure that gives me tremendous amount of ability to go forward and meet problems and meet it with confidence and nobility and dignity. Mm, come on, isn't that worth something? Then what about the emotional equilibrium? That we were, we're just, we're just happy. You know, we're just satisfied because everything is this. Our personal identity is tied into our home, and we have psychological whole, wholeness. Oh, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, to be able to build a home. Now we haven't gotten yet to the point where we're saying, okay, how, how do you do that? We're just talking about the benefits because I want you to say to yourself, ah. This is what I want. What Rabbi Perlmutter is talking about is exactly what I want. How do I do that? You may already have accomplished this. Thank God. I'm, I'm wonderful. Maybe I'll add one or two ideas tonight that will even make it better. Nerba always said, as good as good as better is better. If good is good is better, not better. Of course. So even if you've already created this, maybe tonight we'll touch upon one or two little issues that may push you over, over the edge even to be happier, more confident more satisfied, more secure. You, you never know. But I just wanted to show you why it's going to be worth it to go through all of the work. Because ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest, in order to create a home, it's not going to be passive. It's not going to be something that you're just going to sit like this and you're going to dive in very hard. Please, God, make my house a home, make my house a home. And you're just going to sit there waiting and you're going to let like the grass grow if you let the grass grow without watering out, taking out the, the, the weeds, it's going to be, it, it's nothing. It doesn't, does, it's not a beautiful garden. It's just, it's going to be a mess. The same thing is true here. If you want to accomplish all of these, if this, what I said before in the last 20 minutes, appeals to you and, and talks to you because this is what I want, Rabbi. Yes, I want this. I want this not only for me. I want this for my wife. I want this for my children. I want this for my partner. I want this for anybody that lives in this house. Regardless, whatever it is, I want it. 
I want it. Yes, then we're gonna have to say, hey, hey, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to work. We're gonna have to work in it. It's you're gonna have to be active, and it doesn't only do it once. You can't just say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna do it once. I'll do Rabbi Perlmutter's exercises one time, and it's gonna be over. No, no, no. This is this is an ongoing thing. We're always gonna be involved in making our our home, because the body and the soul are going to be working together. We're going to make the body happy, and we're also going to make the soul happy. The body gets taken care of by the physical aspects. The soul and the mind get taken care of the emotional and the spiritual aspects of the house. So, let's get down to it, you're saying. Rabbi Perlmutter, we, 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 we came here this evening. We want to have to part of the we want to We want to know the secret. What are the secrets of making a happy home? Okay, okay. We're getting to it. I just wanted to build my case and show you all of the benefits. Because if I would have just built the case and then the benefits would have said, nah, maybe, maybe it's not worth well, You see, it's going to be worth it. All the hard work is going to pay off. So how are we going to make our house into a happy home? So we have to learn from the greatest architect ever in history. Hashem himself. Hashem himself. Who, when he wanted to have a home for himself, not only a house, but a home, told us exactly what should be in that home in order for him to be satisfied. Now, who is better? Which better architect? Who can you think of something, an entity, that is going to give you a recipe, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to say that if you do A, B, C, and D, then you're going to be successful? Who better than Hashem himself? Hashem himself is telling us, if you do this, then you're going to be able to say, ah, put up a sign, Home sweet home. See, no one no one ever says, house sweet house. Nah, that doesn't work. Home sweet home. So how do we do this? Okay. So if we go to the book of Exodus, after the Jewish people had come out of the land of Egypt, and they had gotten the Ten Commandments at Sinai, and after this whole debacle of the, you know, you know, uh, of the of, of, of the, the, the golden calf, all right? Hashem said, to Moses, I want you to build for me a sanctuary. I want a sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, I'm going to reside. Okay, so first thing you think to yourself, okay, what does that even mean? I mean, how is a great God going to go into a small sanctuary? I mean, God is enormous. He's, he's limitless. How is he going to enter into a small sanctuary? But that question really was asked by Solomon at the temple, and he answered the question, yes, God's will is he's going to reside there. That's it. This is what he wants. And God then goes into great length of explaining to Moses exactly what he wants in that sanctuary. And let's go through it just a little bit, okay? This is God's dwelling place. It's going to be the ultimate, the ultimate home, okay? So we call it a mishkan. We call it a sanctuary. And God said, well, I want walls and I want covering on it. Yes, and I want some curtains dividing it, yes. But inside of the sanctuary, I want four major articles made to reside in the sanctuary to perform various functions. Number one, I want a table. And the table should have on it 12 loaves of challah to be changed every week. It's called the shulchan, number one. I want in the sanctuary to have a menorah, a lamp, a lantern, made out of gold, beautiful. I want in the, in the, uh, I want in the sanctuary to have an altar. On the altar, we're gonna bring sacrifices. There was a second altar, but let's talk about the altar of sacrifices. And then I want an ark. Now, I didn't go in according to the biblical order of things. These were the four main articles that God wanted in his sanctuary, in his home. Now, it says, Osli migdash v'shachanti betocham, Make for me a sanctuary so I shall dwell in them. The rabbi said, what do you mean betocham? Did it mean plural? You only have one sanctuary. You say betocho, that I will dwell in it. Why betocham? So it says that every person is responsible for building a sanctuary in their heart, making themselves a sanctuary for God, making their home a sanctuary for God. Then we understand betocham, that I'm going to reside in each and every one of yours personal sanctuaries. Okay. So let's go through. God told us, okay, listen, this is what we need. I need a table, I need a menorah, I need an altar, and I need, I need an ark. So let's see how that reflects us today. 
the table was very easy. To me, this means the dining room table, that just like the table had showbreads and it was a sacrifice to God or the Kohanim actually got, you know, the showbreads, this to us today, this is our dining room table. Our dining room table needs to become, or if it isn't already, needs to become the place of the Shulchan in the Mishkan and in the Beis HaMikdash, in the, in, 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 in the Grand Temple. Because why? Because around that table, around that table, just like the Shulchan and the Mishkan was giving sacrifice, around that table we discuss issues that are important to us, ladies and gentlemen. I've mentioned it once, mentioned a hundred times. If you talk about the most important article in your home, it's not your bedroom, it's not even the fancy bathroom you have, it's not, it, it's the dining room table. Because there, ladies and gentlemen, this is at this, the, the spot is that where your children learn all of the values in your family, all of the values in your family. So when we have dinner together, when we eat breakfast together, and certainly on Shabbat and the holidays, when the family gets together, that is the most important part of your home. That table takes on tremendous spiritual significance. Tremendous spiritual significance. It's not only has four legs and a and 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 and, 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 and a tablecloth. No, around there is where your children listen to a story. It's around there where our history is talked about. Around there is where our values are mentioned. So when your children, when your children have grown up. And their children ask them, Dad, what was it like in your home? What was, what, what was going around the table? You want them to be able to say with pride around our table, we talked about issues. We talked about significance. We talked about important things. We also had a good time. Zaidi and Bobby told us about their lives, whether it was my parents, you know, back in Europe or my in-laws in, in the early, when they lived in New York in the early part of the, you know, of the century, the earlier part, not the early part, uh, no, earlier part, you know, of the century, before 1950, right? That's what we want. That's the table that we need in our house, the menorah. Now, if you can get a menorah like they had in the century or a piece of gold that was, that stood, that's great for you, but that's not what, what is needed in our house. What's needed in our homes is the light, the light which reflected the tranquility, the tranquility, the warmth, and the light all led to a most important thing called peace. We'll get to that a little bit later on, the importance of peace. But that's what the menorah was. So that needs to permeate in your home. So when we flick on a light, you know, instead of just having, you know, uh, light bulbs going off, it's the spiritual aspect of the menorah that permeates a home. So when a visitor comes in, when someone comes into the house, he sees already in your home, oh, you have a menorah. Why? because there's warmth in this house. You could feel this house is imbued with spiritual warmth. You feel the tranquility. You feel the love. You feel the happiness. One of the things I want to go back to the table is laughter. I forgot even to mention that because that was something very important to me and my family that we should be able to laugh around the table. So when you walk into your house, you have the lamp, but the lamp is not there in the, in the sense of, of kindling a lantern. No, no, it's a sense that we have this warmth, tranquility, and the light. In, you know, in our house, the altar, we want to, we're not, not going to bring sacrifices. No, no, you can't bring any sacrifices today. But you know what? What do sacrifices mean for a family? We think around, what do, what do you mean by sacrificing, you know, around the family? Compromise. You have to sacrifice some of your needs, sacrifice some of your opinions, sacrifice some of your wants for the betterment of the whole, of everybody here in this home, for the betterment of everybody. You know what? I'm going to go along to get along. Unity. Can you imagine anything stronger, a stronger unit than a united family? Nothing. Nothing is stronger than that. Because it ultimately breaks down that your family is the closest to you. And when you have that altar, when all of you understand that we're all working towards a common good, all of us are willing to sacrifice. We're willing to sacrifice. It doesn't have to be placed upon us. The moment that you say to yourself that, you know what, I'm going to dictate in this family, I'm going to be the boss. I'm going to be the champion. I'm going to be the father, the tough guy. You know, in this family, it's not going to work. It has to be a united effort. And that united effort is going to take a sacrifice. And that sacrifice is represented in the altar. And then we have the beautiful ark. The ark that stood in the Holy of Holies. And that is the holiness in your home. 
That means that when a person walks in into your house, when someone walks in, when you walk in, you feel that there's a holiness here. How? By having a mezuzah at the front door, by having holy books, by a Shabbos, you on a Friday night, the angels look in and they see the candles are lit. They see everybody standing or sitting around the table, two delicious chalas, uh, you know, a bottle of wine, the father, the mother, whoever it is, doesn't matter. It could even be you alone. It doesn't have to be with, with, with a family. It could be that you're alone. It could be that you're only two people. It could be that you're 22 people. It doesn't matter. But the angel looks in the window and he sees that there's holiness in this house. There's a spiritual aspect of this house. Just like the ark contained in itself the Torah, the the the, the, luchas, the commandments of the of the Almighty, the same thing is true that those commandments relate to us today here in our home. It's the holiness, you know, of it. So when you have these four aspects, ladies and gentlemen, you have the table, you have the menorah, you have the altar, you have the ark. Now we are starting to build a home. Now we're ready to start building a happy home, which leads us. And the most important thing, peace. Nothing. Hashem, Hashem gave all the blessings, all the blessings. But he said the most important one is peace. When you don't have peace in the home, then now, don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Peace does not mean that everybody has to agree with everybody all the time. And everybody has to get along with each other all the time. That's not happening. It's never happened. We are going to go through some tough times. We're going to go through some rough times. There'll be disagreements. There'll be arguments back and forth. But ultimately, we're going to know that peace is going to prevail. Why? Because I want to quote to you from a piece of Maimonides. You're familiar with Maimonides. I mention him all the time. The great, he lived 800 and some odd years ago, you know, from Spain. And he moved to, he was in Egypt. He was a great codifier of Jewish law. He was a physician. He was just... You know, I mean, I don't have to say en uh, enough about, I don't have to say enough about Maimonides. But he writes in his book of laws, he writes something interesting. He writes about a conflict. And how do you resolve this conflict? And he writes like this. Listen closely to this, ladies and gentlemen. If a person does not have enough money to purchase both Shabbos candles and Hanukkah candles, okay, he can only afford one. Or if a person doesn't have enough money to purchase both Shabbos candles to light or wine for Shabbos Kiddush and wine, I'm sorry. So either or the, the, Hanukkah, the Hanukkah candles or the Shabbos wine. The Shabbos candles takes precedence because they bring peace to his home. Peace to his home. Okay? Peace is so great that the entire Torah was given to bring peace to the world. And he quotes Proverbs, its ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. So, how are we going to accomplish this, ladies and gentlemen? We know already we have a menorah, and we have an altar, we have this, but let's get down to some very basic ideas. Let's get down to some very basic ideas, okay? Here's some practical, practical things that we may practice in order that we should be able to accomplish this idea of our goal of making a house, physical structure, physical structure into a sanctuary for ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean our families and inviting God into it and inviting outsiders into it. So here's, here's, some, here's some basic ideas. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, and I can't emphasize this enough, is show your love. You may be a loving person, and in your heart, you may have all the love stored up to live 27 different lifetimes. But if you're not showing the love, what good is that? It's stuck inside your heart. Expressions of love are not just for special occasions. Each member of your family needs to see, to hear, and to feel love every day. We talked about this, you know what? I la 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 love. I love you in a relationship. To say that to your wife. To say that to your children, to hug them. I mean, today hugging on the outside is out, but I think in a family it still may be permissible to give them a hug, to express your love, to show them, you know, that you really, really do care for them. And not only that they have to guess, does my dad love me? Does my dad not love me? He's, he, I think he loves me because he's my dad. No, no, no. Show your love. Show your love. 
Okay? Stay committed. Stay committed. Remember, commitment means putting family first. It means supporting and encouraging each other in good times and in tough times. Because the family is a building block for the larger community. Commitment learned at home has effects beyond one's household, right? We talked about the benefits of the, the psychological and emotional benefits. Where do we get it from? We get it from our home, from our family. So stay committed. Make sure, make sure you're encouraging and you're supportive. What's going on? Talk to your children. Now I have grandchildren come to visit. Talk to your grandchildren, you know, about, about what's going on both in good times and bad times, meaning that, you know, sometimes your children are going to disappoint you. I know that's hard to hear. Oh, my goodness gracious. Rabbi, what are you saying? What are you saying? I say, sometimes your children are going to disappoint you. They're going to bring home a bee. Can you imagine a bee? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My son got a bee. He's never going to get into Harvard Medical School. What am I going to do? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Stay committed to them through good times, when he brings all those A's and she brings all those A's to bad times, when they bring the B's and C's and maybe even a D every once every once in a, in a moment. Because why? Because when they know that you have their back, when they know that no matter what, they disappointed you, yes. Yeah, and it could be, and they may feel ashamed that they disappointed you, but they know that, you know what, you love them and you're going to stay committed to them no matter what, no matter what, okay, no matter what. Now, here in America today, I found, and I'm not sure if you're going to agree with me, a tremendous lack of respect for anything, for, for just anything, whether it's any institution. You just name an institution, and I think that we, we, we don't respect it. Talk about politicians, forget about it. Talk about it, forget about it. I mean, it's just overall lack of respect. That can't happen in a home. In a home, we have to act with respect, meaning that we accept others as individuals. Just because they're my children doesn't mean that I'm their, I'm their master. No, no, no. That's not the way it was. It is. Everyone is an individual. And when does that start? When does that start? Well, you think, Rabbi, of course, that starts when they're 18, when, when, when they can vote, when they can go out there, when they're 21, when they can buy something. No, 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 no. That starts when they're children. Children need to know that they are individuals. Individuals. We respect them and we respect their feelings. So if my child at four years old or five years old said to me, Daddy, I'm sad, I just don't scream at him and say, yeah, stop crying or, or, or give me a smile. No, no, no. I respect them and I respect their feelings. I know if they're hurting, they're hurting. And I say to them, you know what? I feel, I'm feeling for you. So tell me what is bothering you and listen, listen. Not like that kid that said to their father, you know what? You're listening with your ears, but you're not listening with your eyes. Huh? That means, you know, your eyes are somewhere else. You're watching TV. You're reading a paper. You're on your phone. Or say, okay, what's wrong? What's wrong? But in the meantime, you're checking your, 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 your tweets or whatever, whatever else is going on over there. When you listen to your children or listen to your spouse or listen to anybody else in your home, it's really, really listen. Really listen. Be honest. All of this is part of acting with respect. Be honest with each other, right? Don't assume... Don't assume that they immediately understand your needs. When you come home, why is that? Why? Why is dinner not? Why is this? You're assuming that everybody in the house automatically knows exactly what you need. All right. So therefore, if something doesn't happen exactly the way you like it, automatically it's something is wrong. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works in a home. That may how way it works in a house. You know, in a broken house. But in a home, that's not the way it works, ladies and gentlemen. In a home, if you have needs and you would like something to be done, express it. Say it clearly and honestly. That means that, you know what, if you want the children's room to be cleaned up, express that. If you want the laundry to be folded away, express that. If you want your son to take the garbage out, express that. Don't expect him to say to himself, oh, you know what, the garbage is full. I think today I'm going to take the garbage out. Oh, and then you come home. And he didn't take the garbage out. So right away, you, you're, you're angry. No, 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 no. You love him. He loves you. But he doesn't know exactly what you want from him. So therefore, you have to 
automatically you have to express your wants and your needs. And when he does that, when he does that and he does something good or she does something good or somebody else does something good, recognize that. This is all in the avenue, in the category of respect. Recognize it, but don't only recognize it, express it. Say, hey, job well done. You know, you, you, you mowed the lawn, this job, great job, excellent job. Express that appreciation. Don't just hold it back and say, to you, you're nodding your head. No, 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 no. Express appreciation rather than take things for granted. Right? And the same thing, and expect to work at these relationships. This takes time, but all of this all comes into this category of respecting each other. And if you can do this, it always it's another building block, another building block to turning the house into a home. Be supportive in crisis. Oh, a lot of times, you know what? Every home, every home is gonna have its dark periods. God forbid a, a grandparent passes away. Uh, the father loses his job. The mother loses her job. The children fall, you know, do, do something foolish and get, you know, get into trouble. We're all going to find ourselves in these situations. These are the dark moments, you know, in a family. It's a, there's a crisis in our family. So what are we going to do? If you're building a house, everyone will run to their rooms and fend for themselves. You know what? You got into trouble. Too bad. Deal for yourself. Oh, honey, your dad passed away. I, man, everybody's going to be scattered, but not in the home. In a home, we support each other through thick and thin in crisis. Family members need to offer practical and emotional support as much as they possibly can. And if you can't, if you can't help the person, like you try your best to help whatever it's going to, your spouse, your whatever it is, and you can't, maybe you go out for some. Only then, only then, I'm not a big proponent of telling your problems to the whole world. No, I, I don't like that. There's things in the family that need to stay within the family. I'm not a kind of a guy that every, I have 27 rabbis that I'm calling up and I'm telling every one of those 27 rabbis my problems. No, this, I, I, I don't buy this. I buy that if at the end of the day, if me and my family cannot solve this problem or I feel that I need some more emotional help that I myself cannot. So of course I always could turn to prayer. I can turn, you know, you know for sure, always always do that but i may go out there and i reach out at that time to a friend or to a professional but only after already examining and exhausting all available aspects within it another thing that people do in a home is learn to forgive people are going to make you angry yes they're going to do things there's going to be conflicts so number one is resolve that conflict don't let it linger remember how many times People have you heard stories there was a little scab and then the scab grew and grew and grew. By the time you got to the doctor, it's too bad I had to amputate the arm. Why? You could have gone, you could have solved it right away without doing anything, but you didn't. You waited thinking it's gonna it's gonna pass. If there's a conflict, resolve it. Don't go to sleep angry. Make sure that you know what, whatever's on your heart or whatever is on your family's heart, your children, your wife, whatever it is, resolve it. Resolve it. And then learn to forgive. Don't hold grudges and apologize if you have to. You know what? Sometimes, you know, your, you know, your, 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 your wife or your child calls you in the middle of the day and then, you know, you're busy making a big deal. You're buying buildings, selling buildings, whatever it is, and you're, you're short and you're, and, 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 you're, and, you're, and you're nasty on the phone. And, you, and then you realize, well, well, what did I just do? I was nasty on the phone to, to, to a family member for what? She asked me a, a, a question. No, but I was so busy, wrapped up in this most important thing because I am the titan of industry. I am Warren Buffett myself. And they're asking me silly questions about what color balloons we should buy, you know, for the birthday party on, you know, on Sunday. Oh, so, so, what, did, so what did you accomplish? What did you accomplish? Nothing. So when you come home tonight, instead of it being your sanctuary, you have someone who has hurt feelings. It was you, it was your fault. And what you need to do is to apologize. You need to apologize for that, to reinforce the kind of love that we're trying to emphasize here in the home. Listen, speak and share. Honest, open communications is essential. So you gotta listen when someone is talking, as I mentioned before, and share your feelings with them. Spend time together. 
I can't, I can't, you know, to now with COVID, we're spending maybe too much time together, but normally spend time together. We need time for ourselves. And then enjoy, enjoy. Make your home a pleasurable, a, 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 a wonderful, open, fun place to do. You know, make games, play games. You know, when I've often talked about the the, 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 the fellow who, uh, who whose father left him millions of dollars, but in the will wrote he'll only collect it when he goes crazy, and he couldn't figure out what does his father mean when he goes crazy. So he went around from town to town asking rabbis and, and sages, what does my father mean until he came to one great sage? And he walked in, before walking into his house, he looked through the window and he saw him on the floor crawling on all fours and with three children on his back, he's running and scurrying around the floor. And he says, the guy is crazy. And then it hit him. That's what his father meant, to go crazy. Because that, what the, what the sage was doing and having the children on his back and running around, that's what creates memories, ladies and gentlemen. And one of the key aspects of a home is to create memories. Memories. That's what makes the beauty, the, 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 the atmosphere, the flavor, the aroma of the home. When your children leave, you want them to be able to say, ah, you know what? And they, in turn, they, in turn, will take all of these things between the love and the commitment and the respect and the support and the forgiveness and the, and the value of spending time together and celebrating together and then having an open home and inviting guests in. Not today, I understand, with COVID, but when things uh, straighten out to open up your home to others, then, then other people come in and your children see that you share this bounty of love and commitment, not only with our own family, but with community members. What, what do they get? What do they get? Then now we're raising a generation of children that when they have their own house, when they have their own house, you know, the four physical walls, they will in turn make the effort to turn that into a home. Then we have the strength of taking this home and now taking it outside because we're confident and we're strong and you know what we're we, we have this emotional equilibrium so now that we when, when we go outside and people see us we are like a ray of light to the world and that's what god wants he made an outside world why did he make an outside world for us to be able to perfect it to go out there when we see something is wrong from our house where we get the strength where we gather in all of this spiritual all of the spiritual strength, now we take it outside. Now, that's, that's something, ladies and gentlemen, that we need more than ever now. Why? Because I told you, I told you, I should scream from the top of the rooftops, the family is under stress. The family's under stress for me to for me to 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 market this properly. I should have written, Oy vey, the country is falling apart. Families are falling apart. People are losing their homes. People are going into foreclosure. It's terrible. It's terrible. And only one person can save the country. Me. Only Rabbi Perlmutter has the answer for you. That's it. So show up tonight. Oh, then, oh, yeah, the country is falling apart. Ladies and gentlemen, the family is under stress. You know what? Because, why? Because I've talked about all of the issues on a positive matter. But now we have, we have issues that are going on in the home. In the home, you know, there's not enough money. People are hurting. There's, you know, no one knows what's going on. Undefined roles in the family. You know what? The kids are running the show. Sometimes you go into a, in, 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 into a house and you see that the kids are actually running the show. The parents are, are absentee. They're gone. They, 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 they don't know what to do. They don't know what, there's no intimacy. There's no love. There's nothing that, that we've talked about before. You know, all those ideas that we've mentioned. A wise man once said, and listen to this, a wise man once said, can you tell me how to build a happy home? How, how do you tell me? And the answer that he gave was like this. Integrity must be the architect. Okay? Tidiness, the pollster. Okay? Tidiness, not to the extreme. Not to the extreme. Okay? Okay? It must be warmed by affection and lightened by cheerfulness. Industry must be the ventilator, but the greatest requisite of all is the sunshine from Hashem. 
That was the secret of how to of how to build how to build a home. So now, ladies and gentlemen, now we understand that it takes a lot of work because in order to perform all of the ideas that I had mentioned to you before between the love and the commitment and the sharing and the forgiveness and all of that and what makes this a beautiful beautiful home and of course you know not 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 to forget bringing in spiritual values into the home i mean keeping shabbos together and you know and praying together and doing all of these things now we understand that a that a building that a that a physical structure great is important you need that physical structure it'll take care of everything else but a physical structure without all of the aforementioned things is not a home. And when you have a home, the Torah says, a home is where you live. You don't have a home, is you're not living. You're not living. Because in a house that's divided, a house divided, oh, that, that, that sounds uh, historical. I think someone may, may have mentioned that before, Abraham Lincoln. But a house that is divided is not a home, and it's not living. So we have to start living, ladies and gentlemen. We truly, truly had to start living. So when you go into someone's house, and here's where the second question that we ask tonight, how is your house, your, your particular house, how is it a home? So when you walk into someone's house, you can tell, you can tell the difference between a house and a home. Because you know what? People say a oh, house, oh, you know what? Let's look at a magazine. There's thousands, oh, no, I'm saying thousands. There's many magazines that deal with how to decorate your homes. They call it home interior, home exterior, into the home, all of these things. None of those magazines ever shows a real home. It shows a house beautifully decorated. Oh, excellent. All the furniture is in the right place. All the colors are coordinated. Everything is perfect. The wind, the blinds and the windows are great. Everything is excellent par excellence. All the tchotchkes that are around, excellent, excellent, excellent. It's a beautiful house, not a home. Not a home. What is a home? A home is somewhere where we live. We live in. We live in our homes, ladies and gentlemen. Our homes are personal, right? Our homes are not something that we just have in a, in a magazine. We live in our homes. You walk into a home that is full of love, you can tell that this is a family that lives. It lives in there. You know what? It's, you, we invest in it. You can tell that they're, they're working on this. Well, how, do you, how can you tell? By small little things. Small little things. You see like you know, toys you know, underneath, underneath the, uh, the, 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 the couch. That's another one. I learned, I think, uh, the toys underneath the couch. You see right away, kids are having fun. They're playing, they're playing with toys. You see, maybe the pile of laundry is, is set aside over there. Okay, you know what? The laundry wasn't put away. Okay, but that's that's living. A cup of coffee is on the table. Ah, someone is drinking coffee over here. You know, children's fingerprints on the window. It's it's unbelievable. It's 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 great. A a a, a drawer that needs reorganizing. Ah, there you're talking. There you're talking about you know a, a family. A little mess every once in a while, you know, here and there. This, my friends, is a home. Because a home is where you feel cozy. A home is where you wear your cozy clothes. A home is where you can really be yourself. It's a place where your essence shines. Your essence, the deep things that go on with inside of you are able to come out. And you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, when you come into a home, whether it's lived or this is a home where it's tense. And sometimes I come into a person's home, you know, I'm afraid to sit, sit down on the couch. The old story with the Jewish mothers used to keep the plastic on the couches. Everyone was afraid to sit down on them. No one wanted to sit down on the couch unless, you know, that's that's not a home. That's a house. That's that's a, it's a place where you know, people are not living. They may be existing, but they're definitely not living. But when you come into a home that you tell that people care and love each other, and every home is different. Every home is different. There's no two homes that are alike. No, it's impossible. Just like every family has its unique stamp on it, the same thing is true in homes. I travel, I've seen a lot of homes when I go to my congregants, and every home that I go into has the stamp of its homeowner. 
and the family there. Some people like to collect art and it's beautiful art and it's great. Some people like to collect, you know, when, it's, when there's boys, you know, memorabilia, you know, sports memorabilia. There are homes where books are all over the place. You know, you could tell that this is a home that reads, that cares, that thinks about things. I, my home, I love, I love books. I, I, I don't know why. I, I love books. There's books all over my house and all different places in the home. And they're not very neat because I want someone to come into the house and think, oh, no, oh, no, there's an intel uh, pseudo intellectual, pseudo intellectual, you know, live, you know, lives in this house, you know, lives in this home, sorry, lives in this home. But that's really the key, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what we want to accomplish tonight. The name of this course is to live a meaningful life. If we can create a home, if we can create a sanctuary, a safe space for us, both for ourselves and our families, and that family unit is, 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 is so different in America today. It used to be a father, mother, two children, four, three children, whatever it is. Today, it's all different. It's blended families. It's half families. It's individuals. It's singles. It's elderly. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. It doesn't matter whether you're alone in the house and you created that home for yourself because ultimately you still have to deal with the outside unless you're a hermit. If you're a hermit, then it's all it's your business. That's your business. But if you're not a hermit and you want to deal with the outside, you need that emotional equilibrium and that confidence and that psychological well-being to be able to deal with the outside. So whether you're alone, whether you're two people, whether you're six people or whether you're 16 people, it doesn't matter. All of these rules apply. Every one of these rules apply that this, ladies and gentlemen, is where we get God's blessing. We talked about the Mishkan. And God said that, you know what? If you make the effort, if, and, and there's a lot of work to this. This is not something that happens by itself. A tremendous amount of work needs to go into this, you know, to build that love. Because some people, let's be honest, are better communicators than others. Some people show their love. Some people are more willing to apologize. Everyone is different, but it takes a lot of work to be able to, to perfect all of this. And that's what we're looking for. Not perfection, but progress. Progress. Every day, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit better in order to change that house, home, house, home, house, home. But we got to keep focused, you know, on that, on the, on the great, on the prize. And that prize is that when Hashem sees, man, look at this guy. This guy is working. This woman is working hard. This mother is trying to establish a home for many times. The mother is called the Akira Sabaya. She's the foundation of, you know, of the home. And she's trying hard, her best of her ability. And it's working. Then God said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to send all of my blessings into this house. Just like I sent my blessings into my sanctuary in the desert and then two temples in Jerusalem, this little sanctuary that finds itself on this street, Oak Street, in this little town in the United States of America, when I look down and I see that these people are caring about each other and worrying about each other, committing to each other, then I say to myself, this is a home that's worth my blessings. And when Hashem sends His blessings, ladies and gentlemen, the sky's the limit. The absolute sky's the limit. And He wants to. God is willing and wanting to send His blessings. But He wants to see us Put the proverbial finger in cold water. Do something. Do something. I don't care, but make sure you do something to show me, to show me, Hashem says, that it makes a, it makes a difference to you. If it doesn't make a difference to you, if you like to live in a house, it's that's not a home. If you don't want any of Pearl Mother's pearls tonight, then go ahead, fine. No, no, no one's gonna no one's gonna arrest you. They don't arrest you here in the United States for not having a home. They don't even arrest you for not having a house. I mean, you, you, you can, can live anywhere here in America. But if you want God's blessing and you want him to say, ah, this is the reason why I created the world, because I myself wanted a dwelling place. And my dwelling place that I have now is in each individual homes throughout the entire world, whether it's in America or in Europe or in Israel, in Australia, in Russia, in Argentina, it doesn't matter. That God visits us and looks in through that proverbial window and he sees what's going on in the house. Are we crazy? Do we, are we having a good time? Are we running around? Are my children coming? I can't begin to tell you how I used to love. Now my children are grown. My baby is 30. But when my children were little, I loved to lay on the ground and, 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 
and roll around with them. This was one of my greatest pleasures in the world. And I've always wondered to myself, and I've always had this, this, this idea in my head that even, you know, if anybody walked through that door and saw me with my children on the ground, and we were having such a good time, I sometimes I laid on them and then they laid on me and we bounced around and, you know, of course someone ended up crying, but that doesn't matter. But if someone would walk in through that door and see us down there and say, you guys are crazy, but he would know. He would know that this house is a fun house. This house is, I'm trying my best to make it a home so my children can have this wonderful memory of doing this, you know, together with me. And that even though I may not be the richest guy here in town, and I may not be the smartest guy in town, but what I have here in my house is I've created a home with my family. And that no one can take away from me. No one can take that away from me. And I want the same thing for you, ladies and gentlemen, that when you create a home, and you do your best and work hard at it and make and make that effort. And you know what? Don't be too proud, but show some humility to those around you and show and express and communicate the love that you have in your heart. Then you too will have finally accomplished what we have set out before an hour ago to start with the question is how to make a house a home. And then you and only you, no one else will be able to answer the second question that we ask is how does your house become a home? What's special about your house that makes it uniquely yours, whether it's Perlmutter's or Lucy's or Ron's or Charlotte's or Karen's or John's or Miriam's or any of the other people that are watching here this evening. That's all I can see on my screen at one time, you know, and, and therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we've hit the witching hour of one hour. It's already 1130 on the East Coast. I want to give people time to rest up tonight. So without further ado, I want to say I hope and I pray that we shared some important thoughts this evening. Again, to me, this is so, 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 so appropriate in today's day and age with this COVID and we're spending so much time with, with our families. It, 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 God is begging us, please, please, while this is still going on, turn your house into a home. Shalom, and of course, Shalom Bayis. Is there anything greater than Shalom Bayis? Peace in the home. So I pray and I wish to each and every one of you that's watching now, and I will be watching this, as I always say, please, ladies and gentlemen, if anything that you saw tonight interested you and thought that it was a good idea, please share it. Share it. It doesn't hurt. You push the share button and it goes, and you could even do it anonymously, so I won't even know that you shared it. But if you don't mind sharing it, please. Also, your comments are always very, very much appreciated. Also, a like and a this and a that. Also, very much appreciated. You know, overall, it those it you know because when you get feedback, you know, because it's not the same. I mean, I'm a kind of a guy who honestly that loves to teach people in person. And when I'm looking at myself right now, this is in Facebook. I'm looking at myself. I want to see you. I'd love to see you and I'd love to be together with you. But how I know that you are with me is by communicating with me through a comment or a or a like or a share, whatever it is. Anyways, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you can take some of these ideas and integrate them into your life and make your home the best, beautiful, comfortable, safe home that you can that you can get. Also, if you'd like to join me tomorrow on Thursday for Torah class, that's at 12 o'clock. That's called, we have a class that's called biblical treasures we try to dig out some of the some of the deeper parts of the uh, of the story that's going to be on thursday at 12 o'clock you're always welcome that happens to be ladies and gentlemen for those that live here in long beach an in-person class but if you want to come to that there's only rsvps i can't entertain a lot of people but if you'd like to come and join me if you live in long beach or in the surrounding areas you can always email the show rabbi at show by the shore all one word dot org show by the shore dot org and say i would like to join you on thursday how can i join you and i will give you all of the information and otherwise also on friday we have a preach about the Chaiman message but uh, you know what it's all very nice i'm still praying for the day when you know what we can all get together i will continue to do this on social media because you know we re we're reaching people you know outside of the state which is always you know a good thing to do but it doesn't take it doesn't substitute for the need the absolute need 
for me to be to be with you in a, in, a, in an in person sense. And I, you know what, doing this is great. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I try my best to do the best job I can. But I'm waiting for the day when I can actually see you and greet you. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, good evening. Please do your best to make your houses into a home. I'll see you next Tuesday evening for part four of how to, what's the name of this course? Towards a Meaningful Life. Thank you very much.